Legendary Passages, Episode 95, 21st Argonauts The Messenger, Part 6 of Euripides' Medea Previously, Medea sent her children with a poisoned crown and robes to the daughter of Creon. In this passage, she debates just how far to take her vengeance when a messenger arrives and reveals the ill fates of Creon and his daughter. The Messenger, Part 6, A Legendary Passage, from Euripides' Medea, translated by E. P. Coleridge. Medea turns to the children. O oh, my babes, my babes, ye still have a city and a home, where far from me and my sad lot you will live your lives, reft of your mother forever, while I must to another land in banishment. Forever I have had my joy of you, or lived to see you happy, or ever I have graced your marriage couch, your bride, your bridal bower, or lifted high the wedding torch. Ah me, a victim of my own self-will. So it was all in vain I reared you, O oh, my sons, in vain did suffer, racked with anguish, enduring the cruel pangs of childbirth. For heaven I once had hope, for me, high hope of ye, that ye would nurse me in my age, and deck my corpse with loving hands, a boon we mortals covet. But now is my sweet fancy dead and gone, for I must lose you both in bitterness and sorrow drag through life. And ye shall never with fond eyes see your mothers more, for over your life there comes a change. Ami, ami, why do thee look at me so, my children? Why smile that last sweet smile? Ah me, what am I to do? My heart gives way when I behold my children's laughing eyes. Oh, I cannot. Farewell to all my former schemes. I will take the children from the land, the babes I bore. Why should I wound their sire by wounding them and get me a twofold measure of sorrow? No, no, I will not do it. Farewell, my scheming. And yet, what possesses me? Can I consent to let those foes of mine escape from punishment and incur their mockery? I must face this deed. Out upon my craven heart, to think that I should even have let the soft words escape my soul. Unto the house, children. The children go into the house. And whoso feels he must not be present at my sacrifice, must he see it himself? I will not spoil my handiwork. Ah, ah, do not, my heart, oh, do not do this deed. Let the children go, unhappy one, spare the babes. For if they live, they will cheer thee in our exile there. Nay, by the fiends of hell's abyss, never, Never will I hand my children over to their foes to mock and flout. Die they must in any case, since tis so, why I, the mother who bore them, will give them the fatal blow. In any case, their doom is fixed, and there is no escape. Already the crown is on her head, the robe is around her, she is dying, the royal bride. That do I know full well. But now, since I have piteous path to tread, and yet more piteous still the path I will send my children on, fain would I say farewell to them. The children come out at her call. She takes them in her arms. Oh, my babes, my babes, let your mother kiss your hands. Ah, the hands I love so well. Oh, the lips most dear to me. O oh, noble form and features of my children, I wish ye joy, but in that other land, for here your father robs you of your home. O oh, the sweet embrace, the soft young cheek, 
the fragrant breath, my children. Go, leave me. I cannot bear to look upon ye. My sorrow wins the day. At last I understand the awful deed I am to do. But passion, that causes direst woes to mortal man, hath triumphed over my sober thoughts. She goes into the house with the children. Oft ere now have I pursued subtler themes and have faced graver issues than woman's sex should seek to probe. But then even we aspire to culture which dwells with us to teach us wisdom. I say not all. For small is the class amongst women. One maybe shalt thou find mid many that is not incapable of wisdom. And amongst mortals do I assert that they who are holy without experience and have never had children far surpass in happiness those who are parents. The childless, because they have never proved whether children grow up to be a blessing or curse to men, are removed from all share in many troubles, whilst those who have a sweet race of children growing up in their house do wear away, as I perceive, their whole life through, first with the thought how they may train them up in virtue, Next, how they shall leave their sons the means to live, and after all this, tis far from clear whether on good or bad children they bestow their toil. But one last crowning woe for every mortal man now will name. Suppose that they have found sufficient means to live, and seen their children grow to man's estate and walk in virtue's path. Still, if fortune so befall, comes death and bears the children's bodies off to Hades. Can it be any profit to the gods to heap upon us mortal men, beside our other woes, this further grief for children lost, a grief surpassing all? Medea comes out of the house. Kind friends, long I have waited expectantly to know how things would at the palace chance. And lo, I see one of Jason's servants coming hither, whose hurried gaffs for breaths proclaim him the bearer of some fresh tidings. A messenger rushes in. Fly, fly, Medea, who hast wrought an awful deed, transgressing every law, nor leave behind, or seaborne bark, or car that scours the plain. Why, why hath chance that calls for such a flight of mine? The princess is dead, a moment gone, and Creon, too, her sire, slain by those drugs of thine. Tidings are most fair, are thine. Henceforth shall thou be ranked amongst my friends and benefactors. Ha! What? Art sane? Art not distraught, lady, who hearest with joy the outrage to our royal house done? And art not at the horrid tale afraid? Somewhat have I, too, to say in answer to thy words. Be not so hasty, friend, but tell the manner of their death, for thou wouldst give me double joy, if so they perished miserably. When the children twain whom thou didst bear come with their father and entered the palace of the bride, right glad were we thralls who had shared thy griefs. For instantly from ear to ear a rumor spread that thou and thy lord had made up your formal quarrel. One kissed thy children's hands, another their golden hair, while I for very joy went with them in person to the woman's chambers. Our mistress, whom now we do revere in thy room, cast a longing glance at Jason, and ere she saw thy children twain, but then she veiled her eyes and turned her blanching cheek away, disgusted at their coming. But thy husband tried to check his young bride's angry humor with these words. Oh, be not angered against thy friends. Cease from wrath and turn once more thy face this way, coming as friends who so thy husband counts, and accept these gifts, and for my sake crave thy sire to remit these children's exile. Soon as she saw the ornaments, no longer she held out, but yielded to her lord in all, and ere the father and his sons were far from the palace gone, she took the broidered robe and put it on, and set the golden crown about her tresses, arranging her hair with the bright mirror, 
with many a happy smile at her breathless counterfeit. Then, rising from her seat, she passed across the chamber, tripping lightly on her fair white foot, exulting in the gift, with many a glance at her uplifted ankle, when, lo, a scene of awful horror did ensue. In a moment she turned pale, reeled backwards, trembling in every limb, and sinks upon a seat, scarce soon enough to save herself from falling to the ground. An aged dame, one of her company, thinking belike it was a fit from Pan or some god sent, raised a cry of prayer, till from her mouth she saw the foam flakes issue, her eyeballs rolling in their sockets, and all the blood her face desert. Then did she phrase a loud scream, far different from her former cry. Forthwith one handmaid rushed to her father's house, another to her new bridegroom to tell his bride's sad fate, and the whole house quickly echoed with her running to and fro. By this time would a quick walker have made the turn in a course of six plethora and reached the goal, when she with one awful shriek awoke, poor sufferer, from her speechless trance, and opened her closed eyes, for against her a twofold anguish was warring. The chaplet of gold about her head was sending forth a wondrous stream of ravening flame, while her fine raiment, thy children's gift, was preying on the hapless maid's fair white flesh, and she starts from her seat in a blaze and seeks to fly, shaking her hair and head this way and that, to cast the crown therefrom. But the gold held firm to its fastenings, and the flame, as she shook her locks, blazed forth the more with double fury. Then to the earth she sinks, by the cruel blow overcome, past all recognition now save to a father's eye, for her eyes had lost their tranquil gaze, her face no more its natural look preserved, and from the crown of her head blood and fire and mingled stream ran down, and from her bones the flesh kept peeling off beneath the gnawing of those secret drugs, even as when the pine tree weeps its tears of pitch, a fearsome sight to see. And all were afraid to touch the corpse, for we were warned what had chanced. Anon came her hapless father unto the house, all unwitting of her doom, and stumbles over the dead, and loud he cried, and folding his arms about her kissed her, with words like these the while. O oh, my poor, poor child, which of the gods hath destroyed thee thus foully? Who is robbing me of thee, old as I am and ripe for death? O oh, my child, alas, would I could die with thee! He ceased his sad lament, and would have raised his aged frame, but found himself held fast by the fine-spun robe as ivy that clings to the branches of the bay, and then ensued a fearful struggle. He strove to rise, but still she held him back, and if ever he pulled with all his might, from off his bones his aged flesh he tore. At last he gave it up, and breathed forth his soul in awful suffering, for he could no longer master the pain. So there they lie, daughter and aged sire, dead side by side, a grievous sight that calls for tears. And as for thee, I leave thee out of my consideration, for thyself must discover a means to escape punishment. Not now, for the first time, I think this human life is a shadow. Ye, and without shrinking, I will say that amongst men who pretend to wisdom and expend deep thought on words do incur a serious charge of folly, for amongst mortals no man is happy. Wealth may pour in and make one luckier than another, but none can happy be. The Messenger Departs This passage concludes next episode as Medea makes her escape on a flying chariot. <laughs>